There is a question that I get often, and I'd like to devote this episode to the question of whether or not composers really use music theory to create their music. Before we get into that, let's talk just briefly about what music theory is. So music theory is essentially the study of how music works. It encompasses various principles, guidelines, and concepts that help us understand the structure, harmony, rhythm, and form in music. Now, I want to emphasize that I do not say rules of music theory because music theory only proposes guidelines that some of the most effective composers have used in the past. That doesn't mean these guidelines will dictate what happens in the future. So they're not rules. If you violate one of these guidelines, that's fine. You should generally just know why you're violating the guideline and have a reason to violate it. So if you have some greater purpose or an effect that you're trying to create, then you can throw out the rules and just go with your intuition. So music theory is really important for helping us understand the music that came before us, which helps us write new music as well. So we're really dealing with this concept of whether or not composers rely on music theory during their creative process. And what we are really asking is whether composers consciously apply theoretical knowledge or rely more on intuition. So we're going to dive into this topic and I'm going to answer some of these questions that I often get asked whenever I'm teaching courses. Welcome to the Your Music Mentor podcast. I'm Kevin Yor, and I'm here to train your ear. I'm an author of several textbooks on music composition, ear training, and music theory. I've served as a music theory professor and currently run the Composer Studio over at yourmusic.com. I aim to make music education accessible and provide deeper insights into the nature of music. Please like, subscribe, and find us on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform. Let's go ahead and start with a bit of historical context. Throughout history, we know the composers like Johann Sebastian Bach and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart embraced music theory and counterpoint. Bach's intricate counterpoint and harmonic progressions demonstrate that he does have a deep understanding of music theory. It's hard to believe that he just naturally wrote everything intuitively and the same sort of chord progressions kept coming up again and again, unless he had some understanding of proper conventions, or at least conventions that led to a Baroque, or in Mozart's case, a classical style of music. So these deep reflections of music theory that we can see in the music indicate to us that there was probably a lot of understanding of music theory and counterpoint infused into these compositions. If you look at Mozart, he has a mastery of form and harmony that also reflect this. The other thing you can't deny is that they intentionally wrote particular types of pieces. They wrote arias, concertos, fugues, inventions. If they didn't have an understanding of music theory and form, why label them at all? They wouldn't have that understanding. They simply call it my next piece number four, opus three, opus four, opus five. They wouldn't have a distinction between a symphony and a sonata. So there was surely some understanding of music theory in the process of these master composers from the Baroque and classical period. So over time, these modes, they developed. They evolved into medieval church modes, which were different than the ancient Greek modes. Renaissance polyphony and Baroque harmony, this all expanded the idea of what we could do with the mode. The idea that, you know, a melody starts at a certain point and it comes back to that point. There are certain conventions at the end of a phrase, what we now know as cadences, that help to close off the sound of a musical work. It made it feel like a melody was complete and the section could close and the piece could potentially be over. Or we had cadences that made it feel like the music could keep going on. And these are all things that you learn in music theory. So the impact on composition was profound. The more we learned about music theory, the more it shaped how composers approached melody, harmony, and structure. So from a historical context, 
composers have often used music theory as a sort of shortcut for both understanding what already exists, for refining their ability to compose in different styles, and for theorizing about what could come next. Now in broad strokes, if we flash forward to today, composers continue to use music theory, but they may use it in different ways. They draw from tonal harmony. So they're using modal scales, various rhythmic patterns, tonal structures. That's what a lot of them will use. And so a tonal structure is something like if you have twinkle, twinkle, little star, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. The first note, twinkle, and the last note, are, they're exactly the same. And so that gives it a tonal feeling. It has a sense that the melody starts and ends in the same place. You go away on a little bit of a journey, twinkle, right? We go from the tonic to the dominant, we move up. And then we bring it back down to the tonic again. It gives it this sense of journey. And when we reach that initial note again, we have a sense that we've come home. So tonality is really dependent on this starting point and coming back to that starting point and having particular chords that are used to help define the structural pillar of the piece. So we know where we're going in the composition and when we're about to come back at the end of the phrase. Some composers are diverging from traditional theory, and they've been doing this for a long time, since the early 20th century. So they are experimenting, experimenting with atonality, minimalism, and electronic music. So atonality is one example, is with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, we start and end on the same pitch. Atonality loosely means that we just try and avoid the sense of a tonal center. So we wouldn't come back to the same pitch, and we'd avoid doing anything that made it feel like we have an arrival point that is the same as a starting point. That's a very quick and dirty explanation of atonality. There's also 12 tone where it's much more strict. You have to go through all 12 pitches before they can be repeated, and then you get all kinds of different types of theory, which we can talk about in other sessions. But other composers are experimenting with something called minimalism. That's Philip Glass. You may have heard some of his music. It's a lot of really slow and repetitive music that tends to slowly change. John Adams is another composer that writes a lot of minimalism. We also have electronic music. Composers like Messiaen wrote electronic works. And so composers are now experimenting with harmonies and structures that move away from traditional theory. So the question now is, does somebody who write electronic music use music theory? Maybe not. I personally have taught composers that don't know any theory and they write electronic music because with electronic music, one way to do it, and it's not the only way, is to take blocks of sound, blocks of ideas, and put them together in various combinations. And you just kind of use your ear, you experiment. Some composers will record sounds out in nature and then put them into a composition and organize them into what we call music, which is organized sound. There's many different ways to compose without thinking about music theory. So while some composers consciously apply theory, others do prioritize creativity and intuition. So striking a balance between theory and artistic expression, I think, is essential. So while you can use music theory, or you can choose not to use music theory, I think it's important to also keep the other side of that teeter-totter, you know, going back and forth in balance. Because you, if you're using primarily music theory, then you also want to rely heavily on your ear to make sure that the sounds are not just sounds that have been dictated to you by a previous composer's greatness. Essentially, if you use music theory, you are using something that has already been done. Now, if you use the principles and the logic of music theory, if you go in and you compose something that is original, but then you go back and you look at what you've written, and using your knowledge of how music theory works and the logic and the structure of music theory, if you go in and then figure out your own theory for each composition that you write, then you're using music theory to advance your composition and to actually compose something new. So that's an important point because that is something that is very valid and that's something you can use. If you're not using music theory at all, 
Imagine what you could do with your composition. How much better could it be if you really understood the fabric and the construction of your composition? If you really knew what made your composition work? So many times when I get electronic music composers into my studio, they'll bring me these really great ideas, but they don't know how to develop them. They don't understand how that initial block can be transformed. And it's, it's not by using the theory of Beethoven or Mozart or Bach. It's by analyzing their own music to figure out the best course forward and to figure out the logic of their own music. So if we're going to talk about real world anecdotes to kind of further push this point home, Igor Stravinsky, he's a famous 20th century composer. He said, my freedom will be so much the greater and more meaningful the more narrowly I limit my field of action and the more I surround myself with obstacles. So to translate this, he really believed in the idea of restriction and composition. He would restrict his what he could do because he was living in a time where anything seemed to be possible. I mean, you could create noise and it was composition. John Cage was having people drive through New York City and follow a map at certain times of the day to create a musical composition based on the sounds of the city, and it would change every time, and that was music. Igor Stravinsky was bothered by this. He felt like there still needed to be some semblance of intentional construction, and so what he would do is he would restrict himself. He'd say, okay, I'm only going to use these notes, just as an example. I'm going to use four notes, and I'm going to compose an entire first section based on those four notes, then maybe in the next section, I'll add two more. This is just an example. It's not actually something he did. And what it would do is it would open up his creativity. So he surrounded himself with obstacles. He prevented himself from being able to do anything he wanted. So in a sense, even though his theory was much more abstract, he was using a theory that he created to effectively work with his own compositions. So his innovative approach to rhythm and harmony shows this. If you listen to The Rite of Spring, if you listen to any of Igor Stravinsky's pieces, you will walk away saying, yeah, that was original. There was something very distinctive about his writing. Now, was he using music theory? Yes, he was restricting what he was doing. Was he writing very intuitively? Yes. He probably had a good ability to audiate and improvise, and he definitely developed his ideas in an intuitive way while putting restrictions on it. And that is the goal, I think, of composition. I think that's when you reach a really high level. Because you can intuitively write a piece, and it might sound great. But what if you could go in and analyze that piece and make it even better? That's where music theory comes in. Let's talk about another famous composer, one of my favorites. Not for his music, but for his writings on music. So Arnold Schoenberg challenged traditional tonality. One time he said, there is still plenty of good music to be written in C major. So he's not saying that tonality needs to die completely, but he did believe that we needed to get away from tonality in order to free ourselves. This is a common expression back in that time to emancipate the dissonance. They wanted to free the dissonance because we had this perception that all dissonance was bad. They couldn't handle really dissonant chords. And so Arnold Schoenberg tried to break the world, or at least introduce this idea that dissonance could be beautiful. And you see that in his compositions. But one of the things that he may be lacking is a little bit of foundation and structure to support his really advanced harmonic language. So, in fact, there wasn't much of a harmonic language. It was mostly melodic and rhythmic with a high emphasis on coherence, where we can talk about this at some other time, and comprehensibility. Very briefly, though, coherence is a pattern that you can recognize. It could be a complex pattern or a simple pattern. Co comprehensibility is what makes something able to be understood. So if something is understandable, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, is both highly coherent and highly comprehensible. Something like Reklerknacht, one of his uh, more advanced pieces, 
is coherent, but it might not be all that comprehensible. It doesn't appeal to that many people. So composers, the great composers at least, always have music theory somewhere in the back of their mind. And so that's an important point to remember. So if we were to recap, we can say that music theory remains a powerful tool for composers, but the application can vary. And it's important to remember I'm saying that this is a tool. It's not necessarily the only way to compose, but it is definitely a tool that I think should be used. So whether relying on theory or intuition, composers are continuing to contribute to a rich and diverse musical landscape. So when you use music theory, you can understand better what a composer did. You may find that a new composer isn't following the theories of the past, but if it's a composer whose style you really like and you want to understand how they did it, you can use the logic of music theory, the principles of music theory, to isolate things that are common to past styles, because often we can find things that are common, and then you can narrow it down and isolate the things that are truly new. So you can truly understand what's different about music when you do this. So here's my question to you. How might embracing both music theory and creativity enhance your own musical journey? What if you're a composer that only uses theory? How would being a bit more intuitive help you? Let's say you're a completely intuitive composer. How would music theory help you? And this is a much larger conversation, and I meant to keep this only to five to seven minutes. It's going closer to 20, but this is an important conversation, and I'd really like to know your thoughts on this. It may spur future questions for future podcasts, and I just want to thank you for listening all the way to the end here, and I'll see you in the next podcast. Thank you.